Listo. Buenos días. Es un placer tener la oportunidad de, de convocar a este seminario conjunto entre el Colegio de México y ACUNS, el Consejo Académico del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, habiendo sido el colegio uno de los miembros fundadores de ACUNS, y poder eh, discutir con expertos realmente reconocidos sobre dos temáticas, peacekeeping y la realidad de la violencia criminal en México, eh, que afecta hoy de manera realmente muy trágica al país. Tenemos eh, en esta sesión como eh, expertos en peacekeeping a Liz Morge Howard, que es profesora del Departamento de Gobierno de la Universidad de Georgetown y presidenta del Consejo Académico del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, ACUNS. Su investigación se ha centrado en el estudio de guerras civiles, las fuerzas de paz de Naciones Unidas, con un primer libro, UN Peacekeeping in Civil Wars, que obtuvo el premio al, al mejor libro sobre el sistema de Naciones Unidas de ACUNS en 2008. Su libro más reciente, Power in Peacekeeping, también publicado por Cambridge University Press, obtuvo el premio de la sección de seguridad internacional de la International Studies Association. En este libro, Liz estudia las diferencias entre la acción militar y la presencia de fuerzas de mantenimiento de paz en diferentes contextos. Más verdad que también está eh, con nosotros, es un colega y amigo de ya muchos años, es profesor en el Departamento de Estudios de la Guerra en King's College London, en donde dirige el Grupo de Investigación sobre Conflicto, Seguridad y Desarrollo y la Maestría en Conflicto, Seguridad y Desarrollo. Hasta 2019 fue profesor del Colegio Universitario de Defensa Noruega, fue miembro de la Comisión Noruega de Investigación que en 2015-2016 evaluó la participación militar, humanitaria y civil de Noruega en Afganistán en los años 2001-2014. Mats además dirigió entre 2000 y 2003 el programa de estudios en el International Institute for Strategic Studies de Londres. Sus últimas publicaciones incluyen eh, títulos muy relevantes para la discusión de hoy, What is this thing called peace? publicado en Survival en 2020, What are the limits to the use of force in, use, in, in UN peacekeeping? publicado también en 2018. Y están también dos eh, expertos, dos jóvenes investigadores eh, que han dedicado su atención y su esfuerzo a tratar de escudriñar y explicar los factores que están detrás de la explosión de la violencia criminal en México. David Pérez Esparza, internacionalista del Tecnológico de Monterrey, doctor en Ciencias de Seguridad con especialidad en Crimen de, eh, por The Jill Dando Institute, de University College London, con una maestría también en Economía y Resolución de Conflictos por la Universidad de Exes en el Reino Unido. David ha sido investigador y consultor eh, para eh, el gobierno británico, también para la Unión Europea. Ha sido, eh, es uno de los expertos más reconocidos en el tema de tráfico de armas y desde enero de 2019 preside como titular el Centro Nacional de Información en el Secretariado Ejecutivo del Sistema Nacional de Seguridad Pública. Y está también con nosotros Valentín Pereda, con quien también he trabajado ya durante varios años. Eh, Valentín obtuvo su doctorado en Criminología por la Universidad de Toronto en Canadá. Tiene también una maestría, una maestría en Seguridad Internacional por la Universidad de Warwick en el Reino Unido y es egresado del Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas, eh, una institución con lazos muy profundos con el Colegio de México. Sus últimas publicaciones incluyen Organized Crime Violence, Political Allegiance and Social Embeddedness, a Southern Criminology Analysis, publicado en Theoretical Criminology. Eh, tiene también por próxima aparición un, un artículo, Macabre Ceremonies, How Losetas Ritualizes Extreme Violence to Promote organize, Organizational Cohesion, eh, eh, que será, aparecerá en Violence and International Journal, 
Y Valentín estará eh, explicando y analizando el comportamiento violento de los Zetas desde la perspectiva del control del territorio. Without further ado, um, I would then pass the floor to, to Liz, um, who will say a few words about ACUNS and El Colegio. Thank you so much, Professor Serrano. I am not going to try to speak in Spanish. I understand a fair amount, but I, please forgive me for continuing in English. Um, thank you so much to our four sponsors today, El Colegio, um, the two, two centers and the, the Center for uh, Estudios Internacionales, and then also, of course, um, ACUNS. Uh, I serve now as president of ACUNS. ACUNS has been in existence for more than 30 years as an association of policymakers, policy professionals, scholars, and students who are interested in the work and the study of the United Nations system. Uh, we are re-emerging from this COVID year with renewed energy and commitment to the association. We've recently become an independent nonprofit so for more than 30 years, we were an association of many people with goodwill. And now we've actually become a, a, non, a nonprofit with legal standing in the United States. Um, ACUNS recognizes, I think part of the reason why we've become, there's this renewed energy around the, the association. I would just note that um, Professor Serrano is a member of the board. We have a very active board right now. Um, recognizing that the, the, main, the main issues of today coming out of the pandemic, pandemic disease, climate change, and, and our topic of today, which touches on crime, the, so many pressing issues do not respect national boundaries, which is why we need policies that cross boundaries and research that helps policymakers that might contribute to the policy process. So I would encourage everyone to consider joining ECUNS and the important work that we're trying to contribute to. I would also just like to note, to say one thing about a very famous Mexican economist, Professor Victor Ur Urquidi, uh, was formerly the president of El Colegio. He was one of the founders of ECUNS, the Academic Council on the UN System. He was deeply aware of the importance of the United Nations, and of multilateralism, he played an important role in promoting development as a key international agenda. He served as the technical sector secretary of the Mexican delegation at Bretton Woods, and he played an important role in persuading the president of the second commission, and that was John Maynard Keynes, for those economists out there. Persuading Keynes and others to expand the mandate of the envisaged International Reconstruction Bank. So the, the original vision was for an IB, IRB, the International Reconstruction Bank, and he convinced everyone to expand it also to development, to the IBRD, known now, of course, as the World Bank. He's fondly remembered by El Colegio and among the ACUNS membership. So we honor his memory. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Liz. Um, we are trying in this session to bring together two perspectives that have not communicated in the past, and it's going to be a challenge to try to see what connections, what lessons can be drawn from two uh, different realities that that concern that concerns UN peacekeeping and, and the evolution of peacekeeping and the lessons that have been drawn from that experience and the challenges that that experience has faced as it has evolved, particularly from the turn of the century onwards. And the Mexican reality uh, that has turned over the past two or so decades into one of unbridled violence, um, basically a humanitarian crisis, I would say, with more than 94,000 people officially recognized as having disappeared, with criminal organizations heavily armed that today as uh, the US, Mexico and Canada were meeting uh, in, in, in Washington, the three presidents um, and in anticipation to this meeting or just uh, coinciding with this meeting, there was the arrest of one 
of the members of the families of uh, one of the biggest and most violent criminal organizations, and the response has been particularly violent. So I'm, I am deeply aware that this is a challenging exercise, but one which I think could be very valuable, um, particularly from a Mexican perspective, but I believe also for uh, the debates that are taking place within um, experts like Liz and Mats, uh, who have devoted their time to study and explaining um, the challenges of peacekeeping. So um, Mats, um, please, if you could tell us something about the evolution of the use of force um, within the UN. Well, thank you very much, uh, Monica, and I apologize as well for not being able to deliver my remarks uh, in Spanish. Um, thank you nonetheless for your very kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here um, uh, to, again, particularly Monica, to be able to be on the same platform as you and also to meet uh, Liz properly. We have spoken before, but we haven't um, really had a chance to, to interact properly, so I'm, I'm delighted. Um, with this opportunity. I have a nasty habit of um, of speeding up and speaking quickly once I realize I'm running out of time. And uh, if that is the case, I trust uh, you will uh, you will tell me to slow down, um, but I will try to stick to my allotted 10 minutes. Now, um, I have been asked, um, and I had a very interesting conversation beforehand with Monica about this and about the exercise, as you call it. I think it's a very useful exercise. And I have been asked to provide a brief overview of the history and the major lessons, as I see them, from the use of force by UN peacekeepers. I will not, in my presentation, apply any lessons to the Mexican efforts to stem criminal violence, because I think um, what those lessons are and whether indeed there are lessons is something which we will leave for the discussion. I will also be quite uh, pointed and telegraphic in my presentation, um, making some sort of major, perhaps uh, uh, provocative points, but of course I'll be happy to elaborate later if you think I've been uh, too simplistic in the way I've advanced my argument. So that's by way of background. Let me start with the history before I turn to some of the lessons. Now, as you all know, I'm sure um, there is no mention of uh, UN peacekeeping in the UN Charter. Peacekeeping emerged in the 1950s and remained for much of the Cold War period as a distinctive form of third party military and, and, and police intervention involving usually lightly equipped military troops drawn from a variety of troop contributing countries, all deployed and operating on the principles of consent, that is consent from the host state, impartiality, that is impartiality as the determinant of operational activity, and last but not least, minimum use of force, except in self-defense, or later it was also emphasized in defense of the mandate. Now, this latter principle uh, was a defining feature of UN operation from the outset. And Hamashal, the Secretary General in the 50s and who, who died tragically in Congo, described it as a prohibition against any initiative in the use of force. He saw that as one of speaking defining characteristics. Now, this was what we now sometimes refer to, not entirely helpfully, I think, as classical peacekeeping. And it tended to be applied mostly throughout the Cold War period to conflicts, uh, to interstate conflicts between states, monitoring ceasefire and buffer zones, and was not designed, given those three principles I mentioned, to impose or enforce a solution. There are some very important exceptions to that Cold War pattern we might return to in discussion, but the one I have in mind is the UN involvement in Congo between 1960 and 64. Now, United Nations Security Council resolutions authorizing peacekeeping still emphasize, if you look at them today, the importance of consent 
impartiality and minimum use of force except in self-defense. But as Monica uh, uh, suggested or, or, or indicated, especially since 1999 onwards, there has been much greater emphasis on what is variously referred to as robust or muscular peacekeeping. This was a recognition of the fact that the internal, in settings of internal and civil war, which Liz has written much about, consent was likely to be fragmented and incomplete. And an important background, of course, to this shift in emphasis uh, were the events in the former Yugoslavia, particularly the events around the fall of Srebrenica and Rwanda, where UN peacekeepers, for a complex of reasons we can discuss as well, essentially were helpless uh, standing by when mass atrocity crimes were committed. Now, in the aftermath of those two horrific events, um, a great deal of thinking went on uh, within military establishments about how to face similar situations in the future. The UN itself um, decided to you know, put peacekeeping operations sort of on a hold for a few years. They resumed again uh, in a major way from 99 onwards. But some of that thinking that is perhaps worth mentioning was the French idea that there was something called active impartiality. In other words, you could imply, you could you could apply force, um, you could be on the offensive, you didn't necessarily need to sit back, uh, but you could do it uh, provided it was applied impartially. And some of that thinking later went into the idea of robust and muscular peacekeeping. Now, I mentioned Srebrenica and Rwanda, and of course, those two events uh, created uh, perfectly understandably and rightly a strong sense that this must never be allowed to happen again. In particular, uh, one shouldn't have a situation where the UN was deployed uh, in a situation where there were threats to civilians and these were not protected. So from 1999 onwards, every major UN operation uh, with perhaps one or two exceptions, have had the protection of civilians as part of their mandate. And the largest operations currently underway in sub-Saharan Africa all have a commitment to protection of civilians uh, uh, as, as a major uh, part of their mandate, and all are on a so-called Chapter 7 footing. Now, over this period that Monica hinted at since 2000, 99-2000, Force has been used by UN forces in different settings in a more offensive uh, capacity. That is, I said that um, Hamashal said uh, there was a prohibition against the initiative in the use of force, and that has been set aside in several cases in response to major humanitarian emergencies and threats of mass atrocity crimes. I'll, I'll say briefly something about that record, and there are perhaps five five operations that are that are that are worthy of special mention. It's Sierra Leone. There are special circumstances in each case, but I'll I'll go through them quickly. Sierra Leone in in 2000. There is in DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in 2003, Operation Artemis. There is an important and an interesting, possibly for the Mexican example. I wasn't going to say it, but the case of Haiti in 2004-2005. There is also again a, a major operation or a major initiative certainly on, on, on paper in, in the Congo in, in 2012 and 13, the so-called Force Intervention Brigade, which perhaps was the most radical departure certainly on paper from classical peacekeeping. The Force Intervention Brigade in the Democratic Republic of Congo was authorized, and I quote, to carry out targeted offensive operations in a robust, highly mobile and versatile manner. And the last example perhaps we could discuss is the case of, of, the, of Cote d'Ivoire um, after the uh, uh, elections there in 2011. Now, I will say a little bit about that and I'm not gonna go over time. So before I turn to those operations, say a few things, I just want to, to flag, and we turn into the lessons now, I just want to highlight, and this might be relevant to a discussion or not, what I consider to be two major sources um, of, of barriers, if you like, or limitations to the effective use of force by UN uh, peacekeepers. And let me just put them on the table. 
The first of them is what I might call, you might call structural, um, inherent barriers to the operations of UN peacekeepers. This has to do with the way UN forces are put together, um, the force generation process, the fact that uh, command and control, unity of command is always difficult to obtain, that there tends to be and long has been uh, weaknesses in the areas of logistics and key enabling uh, capacities, especially for the conduct of offensive operations, intelligence uh, and, and, and particularly um, second and third line logistic support. Now we can we can talk about uh, that in greater detail, but I think it's just as well to recognize up front that there are some structural barriers to where these forces are, are put together. In addition to which I should just add that troop contributing countries uh, have different views and always have had on the advisability or not of using force. And that obviously creates a difficulty in terms of, of cohesion of a force. So that's, that's one thing, just put that aside. Uh, these are multinational forces put together from various contingents. The second point I want to mention as a, as a challenge, and we are talking about the period here since uh, 99, where the UN has been deployed overwhelmingly with one exception, one or two exceptions in internal conflicts. Now, when a UN peacekeeping force deploys within the jurisdiction of a sovereign state, where the host state is faced with internal challenges to its authority, it will over time, that is the UN, uh, will and it has found it increasingly difficult to remain above the political fray, however much it may formally aspire to do so. I mentioned the operation in the Congo back in 1960-64 and this is one important lesson from that operation which perhaps should have been you know, carried over into some of the operations later. Another scholar uh, of peacekeeping, Alan James, wrote about that operation uh, in 1960s, I think an important reason for those difficulties. And I quote, on an internal scene, a government is but one of the actors. In one degree or another, the political balance is likely to be in constant movement. And the way in which a UN force responds may well have some impact on that balance or, which comes to the same thing, may be seen as shifting that balance. So my point is simply here that for UN peacekeepers, when they do take the initiative in the use of force, and I'm not saying there are circumstances when it is justified, but I'm nonetheless saying it cannot but have the impact on the political balance and therefore also affect the military and political calculations of conflict actors. And I think that is the problem, if I may say so, in a footnote with the original French idea of, of active impartiality. Now, very quickly, to finish off about these lessons, uh, Monica, if I can, about these operations. Um, in all these cases that I mentioned, and I don't want to dwell on them, I talked about Sierra Leone, I talked about Haiti, I talked about Congo in 2003. Um, the UN achieved what you might call important tactical successes. Um, and I think those are examples where the use of force did serve an immediate uh, tactical purpose. It was applied effectively. Now, having said that, uh, there are some reasons for that which I think are worth flagging. In all of these cases I mentioned, the force unusually were well-equipped, competently and highly capable forces because they were led by one particular lead nation. And that was significant. The UK in the case of Sierra Leone, Brazil in the case of Haiti, and France is the case of Buena Cote d'Ivoire. Precisely the kind of thing which the UN mission sometimes tend to lack. Secondly, I think it is also important to say that in each case, the military challenge faced was, although it was real enough, was of a more marginal kind and could be met militarily by a UN force. But I think the most important uh, lesson from them was the challenge in each case, uh, which only partially was successful in the case of Sierra Leone, to translate what you call a tactical uh, uh, a success or a tactical achievement into a lasting strategic gain. 
And that, I think, is always the, the major challenge facing any use of force, how you link military action and political purpose. That has been particularly difficult in some of the operations I listed. It is not necessarily insurmountable, but it is the most formidable challenge. In the case of Haiti, uh, a controversial operation, but nonetheless, the Brazilians effectively did demolish and destroy the gang structures around Port-au-Prince and in other areas. The real challenge was how you translate that gain into something more lasting. So the very last thing I'll say, I can come back to, to the details, is to go back to what a, a famous British general who led the troops in Bosnia in the last year of that operation, Rupert Smith said before he went and had occasion to reflect upon later. He said, whenever you use force, it is very important to, to distinguish between what military force can do and what military force can achieve. The two are not the same and sometimes they get conflated. What we are concerned is about how military, the use of military force can achieve certain wider political objectives. And I think in the case of the UN, that remains a, 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 a difficult challenge, not insurmountable, but it faces some special challenges given the nature of, of UN operations. Okay, uh, Monica, I don't want to go any longer. I've gone on for long enough. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Liz. Thank you so much, Matt, for that tour de force of, of, of the use of force and peacekeeping. Um, yeah, it's always so interesting to, to talk with others about, um, to, to hear similar research. Uh, so some, some of what I'm going to say will rhyme with what Mats was talking about. Um, we, uh, and I will also say that what I, what I, I'm not going to relate directly what, what I'm saying today to the situation in Mexico, and I will leave that also up to the conversation. Um, I want to make three points, uh, one about conditions for success, uh, another about the use of force echoing a bit of what Mats was just saying, and then speak for a moment about mandates and sanctions and illicit markets in general in the context of peacekeeping missions. So to start with my first book, which Monica kindly mentioned about the conditions for success. Uh, in this book, I was, I was examining the 10 completed most missions with most similar mandates. So 10 cases of complex mandates, the UN's trying to do very similar things in 10 different civil wars. Six of those cases succeeded for the most part in implementing their mandates. And four of those missions were failures. We all know about the failures. Um, in Rwanda, in Somalia, Rwanda, Srebrenica, and Bosnia, which which Mats was just invoking, and and how how those desperate tragedies to have genocides taking place in front of peacekeepers. I will note that since the mandate change to the protection of civilians, it's been more than twenty five years that peacekeepers have stood by to watch genocide taking place. That has not occurred again. Since, Rwanda, since Bosnia. What I found as a pattern in, these, in looking at these 10 similar attempts at multidimensional peacekeeping in civil wars, right? So this is trying to reconstruct, trying to help countries in the transition from war to peace. That it was when the Security Council expressed moderate support, when we had a uh, overwhelming support from the UN Security Council, we often had a lot of micromanagement in how the missions were being carried out. And with not enough support, then you just don't have a sufficiently resourced mission. There are also favorable situational factors, especially the consent of the belligerents, not just the consent of the government, as is increasingly the case, but also the consent of other warring parties, so that there was a sense that the UN was there to help implement peace accords that everyone had agreed to impartially. So, so that, you know, acting more as a referee than as playing on the side of any one, any one party. And we also very importantly had organizational learning. 
So in, in I, and I talk about organizational learning on two levels. One is learning while they're in motion, while implementing the peacekeeping mission. So in, in, for example, in Namibia, we saw, um, Namibia was an exceptional case with many civilians, maybe up to 40% civilians, uh, out in the countryside, attending church, uh, going to farms and to uh, any associations where people were gathered to learn directly from the Namibians about what types of dispute resolution mechanisms might work in the local context, and also to convey to Namibians what the UN was there to do, and also the limits of what UN peacekeepers were able to do. So we saw this active process of the UN learning from Namibians, Namibians learning from the, the UN about how to make this transition from 30 years of war uh, an apartheid rule and even many more years of colonial rule, abusive colonial rule, um, including genocide, uh, to, um, to an inclusive democratic uh, political system and economic system. So we had, it, it, it's not simply, so learning while doing is an important part of this. And then a, on a second level, it's important for the UN to learn between missions and also to understand that something that works in one context will not always work in the other in another context, but maybe there are some recurrent themes. And this brings me to the topic of, of uh, my second book about peacekeeping, which is asks how peacekeepers exercise power. Uh, Matt's noted that all peacekeeping missions have as one of their top priorities now the protection of civilians. We have had uh, to date that I have counted 15 different quantitative studies, peer-reviewed studies published in the leading journals in international relations that have all found in different ways, using different measurements and different time periods and measuring in different ways, they've all found that peacekeepers correlate with civilian protection. Where there are UN peacekeepers, there are fewer civilians dying, there are also fewer people experiencing sexual and gender-based violence during conflict where UN peacekeepers are deployed. So we have this overwhelming quantitative uh, uh, evidence that peacekeepers are protecting civilian lives. And the question in this book is how, what are they doing? How are they exercising power? How are they changing belligerents behavior so that they stop killing civilians? Um, so I won't, I won't uh, repeat the doctrinal differences between peacekeeping and war fighting because Professor Bernal just uh, explained those very well. But I will say that in this book, I'm arguing that peacekeepers exercise power. They change behavior in three basic forms. They, they exercise persuasion. So they, they speak with people, they are mediating, they have uh, information campaigns, education campaigns, they're persuading people to change behavior appealing to our better angels. Uh, secondly, they're also inducing. Peacekeepers are often providing positive inducements. So they are uh, helping to build institutions. They're providing um, medical assistance, dental assistance. They're, they're helping to rebuild um, courthouses and, um, and actually detention facilities. So they're they're, they're providing uh, material assistance to encourage behavioral change. They're also changing the behavior through the use of coercion. Um, Mats was talking about the tactical use of coercion. I would say there are at least four different ways in which peacekeepers exercise coercion. And these are also the basic categories in which police may exercise coercion. So there's compellence, there's the offensive use of force, which we were talking about in five cases just then. So the tip of the spear, right? Using uh, offensive force, kinetic force to achieve your goals. We also have defense, peacekeepers can protect themselves. The, the requirements of defending civilians or defending yourself, defending a mandate, defending buildings are much lower. The military requirements are much lower than actually exercising offensive force. Protecting yourself is easier than trying to go out and destroy or neutralize, in the case of the DRC, a rebel organization. We also have, in some cases, arrest, the power of arrest. In most UN peacekeeping mandates, arrest is not part of the mandate. It's become more and more rare that peacekeepers 
uh, are have the capacity to arrest. They have the capacity. They have the mandate to shoot, but not necessarily the mandate to arrest. Which is interesting. Notably in DRC, in Eastern DRC, we have that contradiction right now. And there are a variety of reasons why. What peacekeepers do everywhere, and I, I'm putting on my French Foucauldian hat, is they surveil. And surveillance is a form of coercion. They are, they're on patrol, they're surveilling from the air and using drones in a variety of different ways. And surveillance is a way to, to exercise power, to change behavior. People's behavior changes when they're being observed. So we have these basic ways in which peacekeepers are exercising power. And that, that this is research that was based in, in DRC, in the Central African Republic, in Lebanon, and in Namibia. Um, turning now to my uh, a third project uh, with the effectiveness of peace operations network in the Central African Republic. So this came out in 2020. And this is based on several months of field research in the Central African Republic and in New York to understand the sources of effectiveness. And I would say that this mission started off as a policing mission because the nature of the problems in the Central African Republic at the time were largely of criminality. And that is why there may be some relevance to Mexico of what was going on in the Central African Republic then and now. So it started with, um, for the first time in the history of peacekeeping, the force commander was a police as opposed to military. He's coming from the police force, the Portuguese police, as opposed to from military. So we had um, uh, uh, an executive policing mandate in, well, uh, almost an executive policing mandate. There was a little funny thing about the mandate of this, but with the power of arrest. But what, what all of us noted with my fellow co-authors is that the mandates rely, that peacekeeping mandates rely on persuasion and positive inducements and coercion, right? So they're mainly about talking and achieving peace agreements and then training military and trying to um, uh, uh, change behavior through, through certain types of military moves. But what we don't have in any peacekeeping mandates is a mechanism of negative inducement of enforcing sanctions, of curbing, of really curbing illicit markets. There is no, peacekeepers can watch um, illicit mining, gold mining, we have uranium mines, we have human trafficking, drugs trafficking in several peacekeeping missions right now. Peacekeepers do not have a mandate to curb illicit markets in any missions. They can do many things, but that is not one thing that they are mandated to do. And I would argue, this is, I'm working on this research now, but I would argue that until we figure out a way to come together to curb illicit international markets, rebels in several peacekeeping missions now have no incentive to stop the fight. They have every incentive to keep going because no one is trying to curb their means of economic survival. Um, and so part of what we need to do is go back to what I would argue is comes out of my first book. We need to adapt to learn to new environments and to learn how to keep the peace in this new era where illicit markets are, are so instrumental, uh, are so causal in, in the violence that's produced. So to summarize, peacekeeping has been very effective, especially at civilian protection, and especially when they're adapting and learning Peacekeepers are not designed to use force. They're not designed to use compellent force. They might use it on occasion, um, but it's not the way it's designed. Peacekeepers are not mandated, mandated to deal with the political economy of conflict. Um, and so maybe this is a new horizon for learning and implementation. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Lise. That was, uh, that was really... Uh, I think it's a very good entry point to uh, the conversation about Mexico. There are obviously very important differences between what you and Mas have so far uh, shared with us, um, particularly in terms of the, the structural and functional features to which uh, Mas alluded in terms of the integration and the mandating 
of forces, UN forces, but also in terms of the mandates and the normative frameworks that have informed uh, these deployments. But uh, I think uh, that this conversation, and I'm persuaded that is relevant for a number of reasons. First of all, because um, there are a number of factors, some of which you have just mentioned, uh, related to the presence of buoyant illicit markets that create very strong incentives for violent behavior, but also because Mexico now appears in a number of indexes and surveys on conflict, including the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Mexico is considered as one of those cases. Um, and uh, Matt alluded also to the case of Brazil and the experience of Brazil in Haiti. And I found it very interesting that while Brazil, in the context of protection of civilians, would have a very strong view about the possibilities of robust and the need for the robust and muscular, mus more mu muscular use of force, Brazil would, in the context of the responsibility to protect, which uh, includes uh, the possibility of resorting to the use of military force in, in a spectrum that can go from the less to the more coercive type of, of, of use of force, uh, Brazil was in fact one of the countries that created more instability in, in discussions about uh, the responsibility to protect. Uh, so uh, we now turn to, to the Mexican dimension and, and David is one of the leading experts that has shown um, the role of arms and arms trafficking as a very important factor um, in the hands of criminal organizations, but increasingly also in the hands of civilians in turning uh, the, the page of Mexico towards violence. David. Hello, Monica. How are you? It's a great pleasure to be with you today, with all you, with my peers from different countries across the world. Um, David Perez Esparza, I'm the head of Mexico's National Center of Information, which is commonly known as CNI in Spanish, the Centro Nacional de Información. And I prepared a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, to discuss some of the, the, the key issues, I think, that can be related to basically to understand what's going on when it comes to, to see the panorama, the scenario of peacekeeping and the use of force in Mexico. Uh, la siguiente, por favor. Okay. I think a very, a very useful framework for this discussion is basically dividing my presentation in three, in three sections. The first is about input, what's coming on as an input to this uh, scenario of violence and criminal violence. Secondly, the output, and finally, the outcome. Next. So first of all, the input. What are the inputs? I mean, there are many, there are many papers. I actually wrote one about it, but there are many papers trying to discuss what can be the causes, the leading causes, the key causes that are related, correlated, or associated with violence generation in the case of Mexico. Uh, just to summarize four hypotheses, I mean, there are many, probably 20, 30 hypotheses. I will just figure out four of them. The first of all are illegal drug markets, which is obviously a problem that Monica and other scholars have studied during the last 20, 30 years. The lack of governance, the territorial control and corruption, basically the lack of a state, you know, the weakness of the state. As a third uh, element will be probably the security sector weakness. Uh, you know, and everyone is very aware that Latin America is the most violent region in the world, but at the same time, it has clear and very strong uh, weakness when it comes to police reform. Uh, there are many, many opportunity areas when it comes to police reform. And finally, and Dr. Monica just mentioned it before some seconds ago, illegal gun markets, no illegal gun markets. In the case of Mexico, we are focusing on all of them in a different way or the other. But I think the most important, but I actually think is more relevant in this particular case, it's illegal gun markets. And I will probably add another one, but I, I will focus today in illegal gun markets. Uh, siguiente, por favor. Okay, that's, that's what I think are the possible, the probable inputs. Now I'll talk about the output. So what do you see? What do you feel when you talk to Mexicans, to entrepreneurs, to people who work in government, and obviously to people working in the streets? Basically three things. I mean, we, we have to be very clear and just not avoid losing time with many yada yada, just three things. First of all, social violence, which I define uh, 
usually as a use of violence, illegitimate violence between two members of the society because they want to fight, because there's money involved, because there's love involved. There are many reasons to believe there is a reason to fight violence, so social violence. Secondly, criminal violence. Criminal violence as opposed to social violence is basically violence that happens between organized crime groups, also known as sicarios, also known as narcos. There are many, unfortunately, unfortunately for other reasons, there are many TV, Netflix series about criminal violence. You know, it's like the Juarez versus El Golfo, the Zeta versus Noreste. Today in Mexico, we have a very strong confrontation between Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación and many other cartels. So basically it's criminal violence. And the third one that is, is very important as well, it's not just as common probably, but it's, it's there. And we have to accept that is the state violence, which is basically the use. It's, it's weird because it's, it's supposed to be the legal use of force, but there's an abuse. There is a, something going on there that obviously abuses uh, the power or makes uh, other instruments such as torture, disappearances, yeah, whatever. But it's related with the use of actors, police forces, army, military, people from the working for the attorney offices who use violence in a legal or in an extreme way. So it's a state violence. Next. So having said that, having talked about the input, having talked about the output, I will talk now about the outcome, which is basically what is going on in Mexico now. So what you have here in front of you today, it's, it's, a, it's a trend, homicide trend in Mexico from 2015 to up to the last data. It is important to note that we publish the data in NAE. So basically we are in charge, I'm in charge, my office is in charge of doing this every 20th of the month. Tomorrow I want to publish this in the, in the official webpage of Secretaria de Ejecutivo del Sistema Nacional de Seguridad Pública. So basically what do we have here? This is the, this is the, the figure, this is the, what the strong empirical data suggests. As you can see, we have a huge increase. We, we used to have a huge increase from 2015 up to 2018, actually, as you might see in the presentation, the top record of homicide in Mexico was more than 3,000 in July 2018. After that, what has happened? Well, AMLOS, the president, Mexican president, started in December 2018. And from then now on, we have something that in Spanish we have called the punto de inflexión, which is something good and something bad. Something good because it basically stopped, it stopped a huge, the huge slope, huge trend that was increasing. But at the same time, we were, and we have to be honest as well, we haven't been um, enough to reduce in a dramatic way as if we would have to, to actually to like to reduce the homicide. So what's going on? If you think about it, if you see, if you, you see by the graph between before and after AMLO, you see that it's obviously very good positive outcomes, but it's not enough. It's clearly not enough. Siguiente, por favor. So what's going on uh, at the national level doesn't tell you a lot to come to talk and to analyze what's actually going on in the state in the national level in the states. What you have here in the case, uh, it's basically the case of Mexico divided by the 32 states. Mexico is a federation of the US and many other countries in the world. So basically you have 32 states. So what's going on? A very easy way to compare what's going on is basically to, took, to take two, two periods that are equal. In this case, it's January, October versus January, October of the previous year. And then you compare what's going on. And you see that in most states, in most states, actually you can see there 13 states, there's a huge decrease of 10% of more, which is very good news. So you see that there are basically three hotspots uh, where you have these kind of decreases, which is California Sur, it's a lovely place. The center north, basically, and the south of Mexico. There's three points, there is a huge and clear reduction of 10% of more. But then you have, the second group of states, which is 11 states with no statistical difference between what happened before last year and this. And, and we have to be very clear with that. We also have eight states, many, but not many at the same time, it depends how you measure it, with an increase of 10% or more. I particularly suggest to pay, to pick attention, to make attention to the state of Sonora, which has a new governor, Dr. Verazo, Nuevo León, who has a new governor, Dr. Samuel García, Zacatecas, who also has a new governor, el, el señor Monreal, Nayarit, also new governor, Michoacán, also new governor, and then you have two states, uh, well, states of Mexico, which is a very violent state in many, in many indicators, and then you have Chiapas, which used to be, used to be 
a very peaceful state and now it has a dramatic increase of 12%. And another state that also used to be a very pacific state and it still is, is a very pacific state, but uh, a very peaceful state, sorry, but it still is increasing because it's Campeche, no? So, so then you have another three different types of states, some decreasing substantially, some more or less the same, and some of them increasing. On average, we are decreasing, but you can see that there are massive, dramatic, and clear uh, regional difference between, between within and among the states. Uh, siguiente. In the following graph, I explained you something that I think is more even more relevant than the increase or decrease of homicide. It's how homicides are committed. In red, you will see the proportion, not the, not the number, not the volume, the proportion of homicide that is committed with guns. And you will see there is a dramatic, dramatic increase since uh, Calderon started basically his war on drugs. There has been a massive increase, not only quantitatively speaking, which is obviously an increase, but also a qualitative uh, increase in the use of gun. This tells you a lot because it's not the same to kill someone with a knife, as it happens in the UK, for instance, or in some countries with a Australia or New Zealand with strong gun laws, as opposed to other places such as, I don't know, New Orleans, or like the US in general, where the availability and the prevalence of guns allows the violence to be higher, not only in terms of quantitatively speaking, but also qualitatively speaking. So in Mexico, we have the two problems. We have more homicides and more violent homicides. Siguiente, por favor. So one of the policy alternatives, I think today is a very important day for Mexico. Probably you may hear about it. Uh, Mexico started um, a, a very serious discussion on firearms trafficking with the US. It has a, a demanda, la demanda contra los productores de armas. It has, it's, a very, it's a very interesting effort uh, promoted by the Cancillería, by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Marcelo Ebrard Casabon and his team. Uh, I think it's a very smart move to, the, to point and to start the discussion about a topic that has been ignored, Mexico has been before unable to talk about this topic. And now I think a very basic concept, theoretical concept of peacekeeping is firearms trafficking and in control of the illicit trafficking. So for me, this discussion is very important. And I can tell you now that by this time, the President López Obrador has announced with uh, President Biden the creation of three different groups that are going to be particularly tackling gun violence, not only in the US, but also in Mexico. So I think it's a great, it's a great day for, for the discussion of peacekeeping. I thank you, Dr. Monica Serrano and all my peers for the invitation. And I do really looking forward to keep this discussion going on with you today. Thank you, David. That was really illuminating. Um, I, I see what you say, and I, I saw also the news yesterday pointing to a 30% over 30% decline in the value of one of the main major arms companies, which is something that uh, one should celebrate not only in Mexico, but in the US as well, where lives are also lost in huge numbers um, to firearms. But at the same time, I couldn't but notice another piece of news today by which Biden announces that he, President Biden, will be enacting a presidential directive, I believe, or, or a, 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 an order by which uh, criminal actors who may uh, be, uh, I think I can't remember very well, but it's criminal actors or agents who may endanger the life of US agents acting abroad, can be seized. So it's announcing that there, there might be extraterritorial operations from the US in places where US agents may be endangered, which is very bad news for Mexico, as you know, um, in particular in the context of very problematic relations and operations from the drug enforcement agents. Um, Valentin will, able, will be able to provide us with some of that context by turning into uh, the, the uh, an analysis of the of the setas and, and the type of behavior the setas showed um, a few years ago. Valentin. Hi everyone. Can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So um, thank you so much. As you know, my name is Valentin Pereira. 
I recently obtained my PhD in criminology from the University of Toronto, and I will be joining the Center for Comparative Criminology in the University of Montreal in the upcoming weeks. So today I would like to talk to you about the relationship between Los Cetas' military culture on the one hand and its territorial control practices. More specifically, I'd like to explore the question of how this criminal organization known as Los Cetas became capable of deploying a large scale, sophisticated system of territorial control to counter law enforcement and military efforts against, against the organization. So this is how I'm gonna structure this presentation really quickly. First, I'm going to provide a quick overview of why I decided to examine this topic. Then I'll provide more details of what I did and what I found. And then I'll talk about why I think my findings may be significant for theory development and for policymaking purposes. So why did I decide to explore this question in the first place? So many years ago, when I started my PhD journey, I was, of course, conducting a literature review on current debates on organized crime and as well as more specifically scholarly debates on organized crime violence in Mexico. And I and two uh, specific things caught my attention. The first thing is that uh, according to leading criminologists, illegality produces tremendous constraints on most criminal organizations, thereby preventing them from evolving into large-scale, well-organized and durable entities. So in other words, according to leading criminologists, most criminal organizations in the world are actually unable to become um, large-scale entities ca capable of conducting complex tasks. And the second thing which caught my attention is that criminologists have a tendency to associate one criminal organization which, with one type of uh, illegal activity and then explain the behavior of that criminal organization <clears throat> based on the perceived activity, illegal activity in which it is partaking. So in the case of Mexico, as you will know, um, this activity, illegal activity, is drug trafficking. And for the past decades, most, uh, behave, mo most of the behavior of criminal organizations in Mexico has been analyzed through the lens of drug trafficking to the point where there has been almost like an equivalency created between organized crime on the one hand in Mexico and drug violence on the other hand. So... These two things which caught my attention led me to realize that there are certain aspects of the empirical manifestations of organized crime in Mexico that researchers have neglected to a certain extent. So which are these things? The, the first is that, of course, available data shows that in Mexico, at least some criminal organizations have become large scale, very well organized, sophisticated and durable entities. The second aspect that I, that, that, that I realized has been neglected is that while some criminal organizations may have started as drug trafficking organizations, they have evolved and have now multifaceted objectives, uh, political and economic objectives, which are sometimes uh, not, studied, uh, not, not studied in detail. And the third factor, which is kind of linked to the second one, is that some criminal organizations in Mexico, which originally focused exclusively on protecting drug smuggling routes and drug shipments, are now focused on quite literally conquering and holding territory for the purposes of establishing their own illegal order in the territories where they operate. So what exactly did I do? What I tried to answer, I tried to answer the question of, how a specific criminal organization in Mexico, namely Los Cetas, developed a paramilitary system which allowed it to deploy um, a, a structure of territorial control over the areas in which it operated. So, of course, I started by reading uh, existing publications on the history and development of Los Cetas, but I also traveled to Mexico City and I spoke directly with 44 former agents of the Mexican government who were tasked to participate directly in the Mexican government's efforts to dislodge Los Cetas from the communities where it was operating. So uh, more specifically, I interviewed members of the now extinct Mexican Federal Police, Mexico's National uh, uh, Secret Intelligence Agency, and some members of the Mexican military. And what did this study lead me to find? So, uh, my findings can be summarized in three, in, in, in three intertwining processes. The first is that recruiting soldiers into a criminal organization does not amount to creating a paramilitary 
organization. So in Mexico, there's a tendency to believe that Los Zetas was a very lethal, very dangerous, and very skilled criminal organization because it recruited former soldiers, the defectors from the Mexican military. And this is only partially true. This is not quite correct because as Mexican football fans would say, it is not enough to have very skilled players in your team to actually have a very good team. And the same goes for criminal organization. It is not because Mexican criminal organizations have recruited soldiers into the ranks that they became paramilitary organizations. So this is what makes Los Zetas interesting. The fact that it was, according to one of my interviewees, the first criminal organization that actually transformed itself into a paramilitary entity. In his words, Mexican criminal organizations have been recruiting soldiers and police officers for decades. What made Los Zetas different is that it actually transformed itself into a paramilitary entity that conducted organized crime. So this military ethos, this military culture, which characterized Los Zetas from the very beginning, was one of the factors that explained how it was capable of outperforming its competitors at the time of its creation. The second factor that explains how Los Zetas became this paramilitary entity is the fact that it realized that in order to control territory, to con conquer and seize territory and hold on to it, it needed to bolster its ranks. However, the strategy that it employed to bolster these, these ranks was actually quite clever. So instead of merely recruiting people, it focused very deliberately and quite aggressively on recruiting professional soldiers. So you, well, you, you may have heard of this uh, infamous advert that Los Zetas posted, I think it was in Nuevo Laredo, uh, in which it actively, it, it, it quite literally invited Mexican soldiers to defect en masse and join Los Zetas promising that it would not feed its recruits uh, instant noodle soup, um, basically just mocking the Mexican military as a, a, like a third world kind of military. Uh, and there is also anecdotal evidence that Los Zetas has actively tried to recruit members of the Guatemalan military, as well as uh, military personnel from other countries. But aside from this, something that makes Los Zetas even more interesting is the fact that Aside from recruiting for, for, uh, former soldiers, professionals of violence, it also made efforts to set up military training facilities, clandestine facilities, to train recruits who did not have a military background and socialize them very heavily into the military culture of Los Zetas. The socialization process took place through rituals through symbols and through rites of passage that very often involve extreme violence. As one of my interviewees put it, uh, and I think his, uh, this anecdote illustrates my point quite well, uh, he said that he once was uh, in a place where there was this operation against Los Zetas, and the operation was led by the Mexican army. And after the army arrested members of Los Zetas, they were, these people who were arrested were waiting to be taken elsewhere and their high ranking military officer from the Mexican army walked in front of them to review what the results of the operation. And as this military officer walked in front of these people who had just been arrested, they stood at attention and saluted him. Not to make fun of him, but because they had these automatic responses ingrained in them because they had been soldiers or because they had been socialized as soldiers. So, these socialization processes explain partly how Los Zetas was able to develop this sophisticated paramilitary structure. However, socialization processes do not tell the whole story. And there's this other factor which I identified through my interviews, which is uh, what I call, well, what uh, a sociologist Irving Goffman called totalistic control practices, which essentially means that Los Zetas endeavored to control every aspect of the lives of their recruits from the moment in which they woke up until the moment in which they went to bed, it controlled everything they did. And again, I'm gonna tell you an anecdote from one of my interviewees who recalled that he once was uh, deployed in the Northeast to carry out operations against Los Zetas. And he received that phone call from a hospital saying, we just arrested a person who was, a, no, a person was recently admitted to the emergency room and he's a well-known member of Los Zetas. You can come here and arrest him. So he said, I went there with my team, we arrested this guy. And once he was uh, on, in, uh, under our custody, I talked to him and I asked, hey, 
how did you get this? Um, no, he, he said he was actually surprised because he expected this guy to be admitted to the emergency room because he had been shot or something like that. And in fact, he had been admitted to the emergency room because he had a very severe foot infection. So he asked him, how did you get this nasty infection? And the guy who had been arrested say, well, you know, I have been working nonstop for the past month. And what I mean by this is that I've been on call for my boss, for my supervisor constantly in my car, because if I don't answer a radio call from him, I know that uh, I'm going to get beaten and tortured and maybe probably killed. So for the past four weeks, I've been inside my car. I haven't had time to change. I haven't had time to take a shower or remove my shoes. And this is why I have this very nasty infection. So Losetas was actually quite uh, deliberate in controlling every little aspect of their members' lives to the point that they were they knew where they were all the time and they could control what they did, thereby being able to maintain this military cohesiveness in their operations. So you may say, okay, but this happened like 10 years ago. Now Los Zetas has been disbanded. Why is this relevant? Well, one of the reasons why this is relevant is that Los Zetas actually pioneered in adopting this type of paramilitary structure. And now it has proliferated and other criminal organizations in Mexico have emulated it and expanded it. Most notably, Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación is what analysts have called quite repeatedly Los Zetas on steroids. Uh, and this has becoming, is becoming quite prevalent in Mexico. Also, it is important to recognize, even though you probably know this already, that in the end, Mexico is actually training by through its military institutions and law enforcement agencies, some of the people who will become recruits of criminal organizations in the future. And as uh, David mentioned, these people are getting guns from the U.S., but they are learning the skills to use them very often in Mexico's military facilities or law enforcement facilities, which is something that also needs to be discussed and addressed. And lastly, and I think this is a nice way to tie my, uh, my study to the conversation that we're having right now, is that in order to think about solutions to Mexico's criminal violence, we can no longer remain in traditional debates on policing crime and policing organized crime. And we need to think about approaches of reducing violence in contexts of insurgency and in contexts uh, where uh, very strong, very well armed paramilitary um, organizations operate. So um, this is it for me. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Valentin. Thank you very much. Um, the Zetas, just to provide you a bit more of context, were responsible for a terrible massacre in 2011 near the border of the US, in fact, very close to the border of the US in Allende, where I believe in the course of one night, uh, more than 300 people, many of them Mexican middle-class people lost their lives in a terrible operation that involved the use of construction machinery to demolish houses. Um, it, David mentioned four variables that have been behind explanations or attempts at explaining what is going on in Mexico, illegal drug markets, lack of governance and corruption, social uh, the, the problems within the security sector reform, and of course, illegal gun markets. But I want to uh, emphasize that one of the problems with illegal drug markets, which as Valentin uh, rightly highlighted, does not represent now the exclusive illicit behavior of criminal organizations, is that it has clearly impacted on all the other three variables that David has mentioned. The money, which are, is not corruption, it's the transfer of illicit rents created by prohibition, well, provides criminals with a capacity to buy or coerce governments. It also makes almost impossible the proposition of security sector reform through corruption, understood in this way, and uh, threats including the type of threats to which Valentin has alluded. And of course, creating the incentives for violence and uh, the acquisition of arms. 
something which is, I think, uh, important in the context of Mexico, which may also be important in other contexts where UN forces have been deployed, is the way in which violent behaviors are learned and socialized through processes of diffusion. And I believe the CETAs have been a very important factor, not only in creating incentives for violent behavior, but also in providing this process of diffusion by which other criminal organizations are forced to resort to uh, the creation of private armies, but also to arm themselves in a spiral and, and security dilemmas created uh, by the CETAs and punitive enforcement from the government um, and the US uh, uh, and, and the US government. Something which I think is relevant for the for the conversation as well and provides another connection with the, the discussion and the debates with peacekeeping is the a way in which the current government, the Lopez Obrador administration, has created a, no, a new institution, the National Guard, which is intended as a civilian police, but for all purposes is manned by military personnel and has been instructed and has been deployed in a basically non-offensive way and with a non-offensive mandate. So the lessons that you were alluding to, Liz, and the, the cases that you mentioned, Mats, in which the tactical use of force can change balances uh, and can create even spaces uh, for uh, initiatives for security sector reform and hopefully for more lasting political efforts, um, I think is something that needs to be debated in the context of Mexico, even if I personally believe that the possibility, and I think this is a lesson for peacekeeping as well, the possibility of creating a space for a lasting political solution is perhaps nowhere in sight because the incentives that illegal drug markets create and all the illicit outlets that are now part of the criminal game in Mexico create little or no incentives for peace. So I turn back, um, if, I don't know, Max, Liz, who wants to react? Um, maybe I can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, just very quick, quick comments. And thank you very much for all those very, um, very interesting presentations and I think um, a fruitful kind of intellectual exchange of ideas. I just want to add one or two sort of m m minor things uh, to the debate, just picking up from what's been said now. First of all, one of the things that the UN has become involved in, uh, in its peace operations, a great deal since the early uh, you know, part of this century, have been security, sec security sector reform. And I think its record in security sector reform is a very, very poor one. And um, the reason for that is, it comes back to something that Lee said, is that the UN has found it very difficult to engage with the political economy of the, of the countries in which they find themselves deployed. Now, one of the projects I'm currently working on is something I'm doing together with Jake Sherman, who used to be at the International Peace Academy, but is now with the US mission. And that's a study of the uh, political economy of UN peace operations. Um, we're looking both at sort of thematic issues um, and also at, at some individual case studies. But I just wanted to say there are two things there, and this might or might not be relevant to both, if you like, the Mexican and the peacekeeping and UN side of things. When we talk about peacekeeping <clears throat> and the political economy of it, we have in mind both the ability to understand and grasp um, the political economy of war and peace in a conflict zone. Uh, in order to do that, um, you need the analytical capacities, you need deep knowledge and so on and so forth. And the UN, of course, needs to develop that and to struggle to do so. And that's a sort of a work in progress um, at all levels, in New York and in the mission and so on and so forth. But I think also we have to remember, and this is where I'm trying to draw a connection, that there is another dimension of the political economy, and that's the way in which the UN itself, uh, the UN mission, any outside force becomes enmeshed over time in the political economy. 
Uh, and, and it's therefore important that we do not slip into, and I don't want to overdo this, this tendency to think of, you know, us and them. And I think from all the presentations, it's pretty clear we're not doing that. I mean, you have talked about the security sector reform difficulties in in Mexico, about how the difficulty of reforming police institutions. I mean, it's one part of the challenge um, is, is, is to make sure that we understand how the, the political economy necessarily can draw in the external actor and that can affect the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the incentive structure. I think just to finish on this note, um, I, I think you referred to something I wrote last year, uh, Monica, which was really an extended review of um, a, a book by Alan Doss, who used to run several UN peacekeeping operations. And I think he's right in stating that the UN is almost, is always, UN deployments are always, you know, have, have a win, the greatest window of opportunity to affect change. Uh, is early on in a mission when it deploys. And the longer it stays in the mission, there tends to be a tendency for it to become drawn into, call it what you want, the political economy or not. Otherwise, I would totally agree with them. Um, and it's significant, and we tend to forget that, what Liz said, that you know, the protection of civilians um, is, for all the limitations and all the suffering that we still see on the ground, it's a significant fact that um, uh, the UN has 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 made a major contribution in very very sharp contrast to the to the 1990s and i think the contrast between you know south sudan in 2013 and, and rwanda in 1994 sort of speaks for itself that's that's all i wanted to to say at this stage sorry thank you Matt. please thank you so much uh monica for bringing us together it is it is really fascinating to think about intersections between our our four avenues of research. Um, the, what, what I have noted over time, it's, it's been more than 20 years of working on peacekeeping and looking at peace processes, is that sometimes there is this trade-off between peace and justice in the beginning. And that, um, and uh, in many of the successful peace processes rather than, um, rather than arresting the heads of rebel organizations that has involved helping them transition to, to political actors. And I, I guess my question is, are we looking at a situation where it would make sense to devise incentives to, to convince economic actors to become above the board economic actors, to transition organizations into legitimate economic actors. I mean, it, it's, that is the only way many countries have been able to achieve peace in Africa is for rebels to move from being rebels to legitimate political actors where they've renounced the use of violence as a means to further their ambitions. And, and is it possible to convince the heads of cartels to renounce the use of violence as a mean to further their economic ambitions. Is that something that you see might be possible in this context? That's my question for you. I will let my colleagues David and Valentin to, to answer that. I've got my own views, but I'll come back. I'll let them respond first. David, do you want to go first? You go, Valentin, please. You go, please. Okay, so I mean, uh, uh, that's an excellent question. And um, I think it's it's a question that I have not explored in my research, but I've heard that other has, has interest other interested other researchers of organized crime in Mexico. My views based on what I've learned is that these incentives could be separated into maybe, you know, like two different kinds of incentives. One, which would be at the more micro level for people, you know, like what is called like you know, like low level street level workers in, in criminal organizations who could be possibly enticed to uh, take other opportunities to uh, try not like to try to fight against uh, the, 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 it's not always necessarily a temptation, but almost like, uh, like the necessity or like the, um, 
the uh, the almost in certain contexts like the forced entry into criminal organizations by accepting another uh, a, another professional opportunity. So that might work to a certain extent for certain for certain communities, especially those where criminal organizations are not strong enough to actually coerce people into joining, which happens a lot. It's not a matter of if you want to or if you don't want to. It's a matter of like we are here. And like you have two options, like you you either join us or like you disappear. Yes, and that's very familiar in many civil wars. That's the choice also. Mm. Right? Exactly, especially for young people, you join us or or there are yes. severe consequences. And the other the other, but at, at a more macro factor, that's where I'm like when you see the dimensions of like the the the, the stakes for criminal organizations and the power they wield right now, it does look like a like like a massive endeavor to try to actually come up with a viable alternatives in the short term for the kind of like money and power they are currently wielding and they, they can deploy. Um, and I, I guess like that, that's my take on it. I mean, I, I'm a little bit skeptical. I would say maybe more at the macro level, micro level, at the macro level at this point, I think that this organization would have to be first weakened in their power, economic power and political power, before they can actually be presented as something that, well, you know, like you don't necessarily want to join this, or there may be another alternative. That's my view. And David, you want me to, or you want to say, okay. Oh, um, go, 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 go on, please. Go. Okay. I, I think, first of all, in the current context where you have a huge mobilization and demand for justice, that proposition becomes very problematic in Mexico. Uh, but I do see that the only way forward is something like the transformative process that took place in Sierra Leone, where the whole of society acknowledges that we all have a part in this and that there will not be a solution unless we assume so, some share of responsibility. That's one thing, um, it, but the, the, the problems that I see in addition to the ones Valentin has highlighted is that while you have the structure of illicit markets in place through prohibition, with an illicit market in the US that without taking into account the value of the fentanyl market was estimated by RAND in 2016 in $150 billion. The incentives for new actors to come back after you have paid the price of allowing a transformative process by which these actors accept the restrictions that legitimacy would um, uh, involve, then uh, you would have others coming behind. And the same type of uh, dilemmas that punitive prohibition has created, where there is the assumption that you arrest one drug lord and that's the end, you will eradicate the problem, you will stop the market. Uh, the same logic would apply. There's no end in sight because the incentives for someone else to take that role are too powerful to stop. Um, the fentanyl market, which was not included in this estimate by the RAND, um, some estimates consider that one kilo of fentanyl can be sold in the US market for as much as $2 million, one kilo. Okay, can I just add, um... Sorry, I, I interrupted. I'm yes, going. please ask. Go ahead. No, I was simply going to say that um, not being an expert on the on the Mexican situation at all, what you just said seems to me to be absolutely spot on in terms of the the major difficulty of of envisaging a kind of transition, which we can see. For example, I remember you know R Richard Kleinfeld's book about possibly doing you know, possibly doing dirty deals and then moving on from something else. And she uses a range of different kinds of examples, including criminal organization in Italy and so on and so forth. And you can see the logic for it. And I think therefore Liz's question is a very good one. But I think as you are, the, the sense is that the structure of the illicit market through prohibition is so powerful, the incentive structure is so powerful 
that unless you address that, you are you are up against a very very difficult uh, challenge of of weaning people off it. And that just seems to me to be uh, a a big difference from some of the settings um, where I suppose you could make comparable examples. I mean, maybe Sierra Leone in two thousand one, two thousand and two, and one or two other cases as well. Just that the, the the incentive structure is so heavily weighed in favour of those who wish to to continue um, uh, uh, criminalized behavior. Yeah. We have four minutes. David, you want to come back and say something related to this or to other? No, I just wait. I just wait. You can wait. Um, I didn't understand. You I mean, I can wait. Do you want, do you, do you you want to make okay. another? Um, uh, my my sense, and this is something. I mean, we have three minutes. Unfortunately, I don't think um, we don't have. I, I will share the questions. I think with you later on because we we really have run out of time. But just one thing that um, I would like to share with you is that there is currently, I think, an increasing awareness about uh, how uh, this. The, the reality that Mexico is right now facing as the reality that Colombia for with other characteristics, but with a production of coca basically above the levels of uh, the levels that were faced by Colombia before Plan Colombia. Um, the reality so and the power of this illicit economy is such with now markets in Latin America also uh, becoming increasingly important, that the dilemmas for state authorities are, are and for society are, are uh, uh, huge. Um, if there are no easy or right answers, there are no silver bullets, uh, but it's clear and, and there are lessons and experiences from within the US and, and that goes also for the, the gun the gun control or gun regulation. My, I have reached two conclusions um, that I would like to share now. And um, one is that without a change in policy, then countries like Mexico and Colombia will, no long, will not only face these uh, difficult situations and realities, but will be forced possibly to consider uh, the use of tactical force to contain and, and, and uh, uh, discipline these criminal organizations with all the dilemmas that that entails. So the lessons that you shared, uh, Liz, I think are fundamentally important for the National Guard in terms of what it can achieve. But on the other hand, what MAS has alerted us to is that uh, the deployment which is intended to become a permanent presence can also be uh, absorbed and can also become a player in these very mobile illicit economies. And that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, it, that's that's one, one conclusion. The other conclusion is that the obvious answer that is regulation of these markets will not be possible in Mexico so far as lives in the US do not count. For Mexicans' lives to count, lives of US citizens, including all those that are lost to arms and to drugs, need to count first. And that's a very sad conclusion, Mats will know, because we've been discussing this for over nearly 20 or so years. And, and it's been a, a very painful process of learning um, but one we need to be aware of. And that's why the lessons that we can draw from other experiences in terms of creating conditions of stability and order in, in difficult contexts can be fundamentally important. And I thank you all. Um, I don't want to hold you. We have now, I think, uh, reached the, the time we have agreed, but if you wanted to say a last word, Well, yes, thank you, Monica. Thank you for organizing this event. It has been very interesting. And to compare different scenarios, different contexts and theories, 
And I think we're going to be a very interesting time during the next year. So hopefully we can take another quick opportunity to discuss this further. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's very, it's fascinating. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for organizing us and bringing Thank us you very much. Thank everybody. you for the debate. And um, yeah. I would, everybody who has been able or will uh, in the future see this conversation, I would invite you to join Bacons and, and to, to be part of that community too. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. See you later. Ciao. Thanks.